Many historians criticize Ailey Selassie for being a tyrant and a puppet of Europe and America. What would you say in defense of those accusations against the emperor? Uh, first, let me just greet your audience in that divine name, His Imperial Majesty, Emperor Haile Selassie I, and say glory and honor in the name of his chosen Queen Empress Wazero Menin. Um, it's an excellent question that you asked. Uh, I have to set some context around the question before we can really talk, because a lot of people uh, make these assertions based on the uh, diplomatic relationships that were entered into by Ethiopia, you know, by His Majesty, assuming that because it's a colonial power, there's a deal on the table that you are automatically a puppet. Uh, this requires greater scrutiny, and we have to look at the whole scramble for Africa. We have to look at the position Ethiopia found itself in, too, um, at the turn of the century when His Majesty was, was rising to power. Uh, and what I find on this conversation is that uh, it's a surface conversation. You know, a lot of people are just looking at the surface and not really digging down. I would recommend to everyone to take a leadership position, first of all, because when you do that, you find out that practice and theory are two different things. So we have a lot of Pan-Africanists that are very theoretical and they love, you know, the ideal situation. Uh, which I think is one of the, the, the detriments to our movement. We're not looking at the practical reality. You also have to play chess because you realize as a chess player, you have to uh, play strategy. The other part I would say, and remember, I'm just setting up the context to answer your question, so I'm going to circle forward to the question. You have to know what is the information because you're, you're, the decisions that you make, the, the plays that you make are based on the available information. So being on the outside, to be a, a a quarterback coach then, uh, you have the luxury of making an ideal situation not knowing what the facts on the ground were. And when we look at His Imperial Majesty, you know, during the scramble for Africa, 1884 to 1885, we have the Berlin Conference. So we have the European powers that are gathering uh, at the behest of uh, Otto von Bismarck, at the behest of, of Leopold, to divide up the continent. Uh, so Ethiopia's uh, borders or her neighbors are all of these colonial powers. So you don't have an uh, African base that is going to help you in terms of the, the, the aim of your independence and your liberation. So I can, you know, make all of these great platitudes, but on the ground, uh, what are the facts on the ground? In 1924, we have a young Rastafari who's 32 years old that goes to Europe who is able to see the foreign militaries, to see the infrastructure, to understand or to overstand that, you know, the kingdoms of Ethiopia, the ancient uh, means of warfare, they were not prepared for what was facing them. Yes, they had won a tremendous victory at Adowa, but His Majesty realized that brute force alone or the, or the heroism of our warriors alone is not going to secure the independence. We need allies. We have to balance um, the world powers against each other. So, in, and, and remember that Europe, uh, these colonial powers are players on the continent from in, uh, since the 1600s. We had one of the first Islamic jihads that was uh, run by uh, Ahmad Gran, uh, the left-handed who was working with the Ottoman Empire, bringing the first cannon into Ethiopia. Uh, so there was a geopolitical movement against Ethiopia from that time. Ethiopia defeated um, that jihad with the help of the Portuguese. So the European presence was always there. But we have to balance because the Europeans are coming with superior military technology. Um, and we're looking at an African kingdom that at the time of the turn of the century, Ethiopia is still not a unified, centralized body. You still have kingdoms that are operating independently when the Berlin Conference is happening. You have the Kingdom of Tigray, you have the Kingdom of Showa, you have Gojam, you have all of these independent kingdoms that are operating. Uh, so a lot of the, the detractors against His Majesty are not looking at what the dynamics are, uh, you know, because you have the British that are supporting some of the kingdoms, you have the Italians that are supporting some of the kingdoms, so even him coming as a young leader, does not have the full control. He has to be very uh, circumspect in terms of how he's balancing. 
I just want to, I don't want to deter from the mm-hmm. argument, right? But I wanted to touch on, which is very important, mm-hmm. that when he did come to power, that you're dealing with a uh, a nation that is divided, not just culturally, religiously, but through language. Yes. So, like, Excellent I just, can you touch on, and we'll get back to the, can you touch on, like, strategy he used to try to unify the country? So one of the things that is mine that we see from a, from a very young age is the strategy of uh, investing in the working uh, people of Ethiopia. So he would take his own money, sending students from different tribes to, f- to, the, to universities abroad to get foreign education because one thing he realizes that to implement his plan, he's going to need trained people. And a lot of the unification of Ethiopia was done through the educational system, which I would mention was also free. Um, and this is revolutionary for the, in the Ethiopian context because the church was the primary arbiter of education in the country. It was only church education. And if you were to not come through that church, there was you know, huge uh, swaths of illiteracy um, in the population. The language um, barrier, as you say, we have uh, over 70 tribes in Ethiopia. We have you know, each of them with different languages. So you can imagine coming to power in this situation, but the, the primary uh, tool that His Majesty used was education, the Tafari Makanin School for Boys um, that was set up. And again, he's not just um, educating the nobles, which was the practice prior to um, Ethiopia coming into this era. And I have to give credit to Emperor Menelik, uh, Emperor Tedros, who instituted a, a system of education that was trying to unify the great houses or the races. But in terms of reaching down to the working people, to the, to the farmer, to the trader, to those who were not brought into, uh, there's, it's unprecedented in terms of how His Majesty uh, did this. And I would argue strongly that this is the reason that Ethiopia sticks together today because a lot of these tribes, they were educated together. Um, when we look at the Aromo Liberation Front, the leadership, when you look at the Tigray party, the thing they have in common, they were all educated in this educational system. They went to the same academies. They got the same scholarships. Um, the system of education in Ethiopia is, is unprecedented on the African continent. And I think it doesn't get enough um, highlight. Um, and there's a reason that His Majesty reserved the Minister of Education uh, to his own portfolio for the majority of his reign is because he, he realized that unity was best preserved through education through creating a common Ethiopian identity which didn't exist prior to His Majesty coming to power because even right now uh, we see that Menelik II, um, uh, Emperor Johannes, there's a lot of backlash against these leaders because uh, the expansion of the Ethiopian territory during their reigns was primarily through war, through military expansion, um, ensuring that the smaller vassal kingdoms were brought under heel before they could be conquered by the, the, the neighboring European powers. And this has created a lot of resentment. But what did His Majesty do? He did not expand primarily through war. Yes, he built on the foundations that were set by his predecessors, but we find that was largely education. Um, he was given the title Light of the World at his coronation, and that light was primarily installed through the educational system. Um, there's also the military colleges. So Ethiopia is known for warfare. Um, We defended our our Ethiopian independence to bloodshed. And this is one of the distinctions. While the Ashanti fell, while the Zulu fell, while the Yoruba fell in other places of Africa, a lot of them prior to the birth of His Majesty, Ethiopia maintained her age-old independence because it was a warrior culture. and so His Majesty took that warrior culture and cultivated it through a system of military colleges and academies to where Ethiopia now, even in the modern era, has one of the foremost military uh, on the African continent, which has also helped it maintain its fragile unity. So education, to answer your question, is how that unity has been forged. Um, Haurak being the national language, a lot of people may not like that, but when we look at uh, China, how did China become a superpower? Was Mandarin always the, the, the national language of all of China? No. Mandarin was instituted during the reign of Mao Zedong. And China also has different kingdoms and nations that were subsumed into that Chinese identity. People can argue it was brutal. 
but when you look at the, the level of bloodshed that was avoided during his majesty reign by his practices and the outcomes in terms of the institutions that all of the institutions his majesty established still exist to today and are still allowing Ethiopia to flourish in the midst of all of that cultural animosity um, I think is a testament to what he did to instill that unity again through education and building institutions. All right. I want to touch on the, the tyrant claim, right? Yes. This is what I've learned from studying okay. African history. I use Thomas Sankara particularly. Yes. He's a person I really rate and has been a great inspiration yeah, to man, me. Definitely. But depending on who you speak to and depending on what side they were on, yes. they will have a different argument for the person, right? Yes. Uh, do you believe that's what occurred with Selassie in yes. regards to who benefited from his reign versus who didn't benefit from his reign? Um, along with the European, because a lot of Europeans, I've, it's very rare to see a European text that's not biased towards Selassie. Yeah. And that goes into my second question, because just like they have a negative bias, yes. Rastafari has a positive bias. Yes. And that's another question I want to get into later. Yes. But uh, continue, like, how would you do the, the, the claims in regards to being a tyrant, mismanagement of funds, and more than anything, the puppet? vibe yes and i think sometimes people tend to confuse diplomacy with being a puppet that is it. but uh touch on those things so we can move on to this so uh when we talk about the 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 let me let me take the puppet um claim uh first and foremost uh, and, and the diplomacy um ethiopia first of all what happened in ethiopia is unprecedented in terms of the transformation from an ancient feudal monarchy to a modern nation state, a constitutional monarchy in one generation that His Majesty did, working with what he did, working with the culture, all of the impediments in the midst of foreign intervention, in the midst of, of, a, of a global war and a war in the country um, is unprecedented. And how he was able to do that was balancing the foreign powers. Ethiopia is one of the few countries on the planet, maybe the only country on the planet where the USSR was, was actively working and the USA. So we had both sides of the Cold War that were engaged in diplomatic relations. You had uh, the USSR, for example, building the Asab Dam uh, in modern day Eritrea during the reign of His Majesty, while you had um, the US with a military base in Asmara. So you had the two major powers. Usually you have to choose one side or the other. You can ask Lumumba and all of these others that, that perish. What His Majesty realizes that Ethiopia did not have the capital that it required to, to develop a modern system. They didn't have a lot of the, the infrastructure. In fact, uh, shortly after his coronation, His Majesty reached out to the African-American community to try to import skilled African-Americans to form his labor base. That was um, squashed by the State Department that wouldn't grant passports. So His Majesty quickly realized, and remember, all the other African nations are colonized and so as a head of state, I may, be, I may want to, and this is where the idealism versus the practical um, things happen. The Pan-African will say, look how much white people in bringing the country. Look at the Jesuit priests where Imam around the school. Look at this and that. But what happened is that when you're trying to build, you don't have the luxury of saying, you know, say, I would have loved to do that. Payroll have to pay up on Friday, and I have to find a solution that's going to be the intimate. It might not be perfect. So I might have to get Boeing pilots to fly Ethiopian airline for the first couple of years. But I'm going to make sure in that agreement they're training Ethiopians. So that when a young, the Chaj Kwasi is flying from Addis Ababa to Accra and the plane breaks down in Nigeria, I can send my Ethiopian engineers to fix the plane on the runway and a young Rastafari brethren can see that is pure Ethiopians running this airline when it maybe didn't start like that. But we have to start somewhere, and this is where it breaks down for a lot of Pan-Africanists in that they want the ideal in terms of, uh, and this is the breakdown between Haile Selassie and Marcus Garvey, not understanding the responsibility of running the head of state and that this is real, you know what I mean? I have to get it done. So I'm, I'm going to have to use the British to, 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 to displace the Italians and People don't understand that the British tried to make Ethiopia a protectorate after that assistance, which is why His Majesty courted America to back off the British. America now starts to want to become the big dog in your country, so this is why I have to bring the USSR to back off America. 
I'm going to have to bring India to train the military because I don't want the Americans to be the ones running my military. So I'm going to get a smaller power. But the Indians, I don't want them to full up. So my generals, I might have to get the Belgians to come and train the officer class. So it's a constant balancing um, act of all of these powers. And you're playing them off each other because even though there's unity there, they also tell on each other, so His Majesty is getting the information about this one from that one. He's balancing that one and that one. We know that these are intriguing in the country, but we, we also have to get things done. And so if we don't, then the, the, the whole thing collapses and we find ourselves like many African nations and we're not in an independent space to be able to provide an independent African nation in 1963 for the formation of or organization of African unity. Uh, and to bring unity between the Monrovia and the Casablanca groups. We can't do that if we're beholden to one power and they say we don't want that, which is what happened to many of those nations. But because we're playing each off, and you know, the biblical Rastam will say, he shall have them in derision. You understand? And that is what we see when we examine how he played the, the, the big powers. Now, if I look outside as a Pan-Africanist, I say, look at US over there, and he's going to US, and look at uh, this guy is a puppet because not, none of them are saying anything bad about him, but they're looking at him from a strategic standpoint in that he's my gateway into Africa. I'm not going to besmirch him in my media. I'm going to lift him up until, and this is the key that shows uh, he's not a puppet. When His Majesty withdraw support of Israel after the Egypt invasion in 1973, America turns their back. England turns their back, the propaganda about the famine and all of these things come, which is what most of these Pan-Africanists are now uh, grabbing on. Ironically, they're, they're using the foreign colonialist claims uh, to support some of their assertions about tyrant and these things. What did they say? He was feeding his lion's steak while his people were starving. Uh, do they understand that uh, when His Majesty was born, one of the worst famines ever took place in Ethiopia's history, the Kafu Khan, the evil days, uh, where one third of the population died, 90% of the cattle. Do they understand that after His Majesty was no longer reigning visibly on the throne, that 1984 Michael Jackson and him friend them have to come with We Are the World for go sing song about famine? So you can't put the 1973 74 famine solely on His Majesty. And His Majesty brought the international the BBC and these ones in to, to, to uh, inform the world about the famine and they use that as a propaganda piece to besmirch his reputation. Now in terms of the stealing of money and things, you touch on stealing money and these claims have been debunked. Uh, Edward Ollendorf has a book, The Two Zions. I'm the reading rat, so you can get some source. May I give you the source then? Um, where he went to the Swiss banks and was researching and found that no, um, there was no money squirreled away and anybody who knows the royal family um, knows that they do not have big, big money like that. His Majesty left them with, you know, uh, modest means, but they, they do not live like the other royal families because the majority of the money was invested back into the country. And I've reasoned with elder Ethiopians who say when they audited His Majesty, they can't believe what he did with the money that he had and partly because as a wealthy businessman, he reinvested majority of his personal money to augment. This is why up to university education in Ethiopia was free. The, um, a lot of the elders who were part of the, the movements against him now when they look at what Ethiopia has become are sad. They, they say they didn't realize what they had um, during the reign of His Majesty because Ethiopia has never regained that kind of world esteem and world uh, uh, standing as, as it did during the reign of His Majesty. So I think that people take one or two pieces. Now, let me be balanced because you ask about bias. Hold on, hold on. Okay. Before you hold the argument, I yeah. just want to ask one more thing. Relationship with Ethiopia mm -hmm. and Eritrea. Yes. Right? Can you speak on that historical? Because it seems like people in Eritrea, if I'm saying it properly, yes. despise Ethiopians. And that is manufactured because right. they are brothers and sisters from an ancient perspective. Um, I've had a lot of runnings. I want to big up my Eritrea family, and this is a sensitive topic. Uh, and they don't like Rastafari people, a lot of them, because of our, you know, how we hold up the emperor. But what we have to understand is that Eritrea, 
has always been where the, the foreign powers have put their stronghold. So the educational system, the orientation that they have received uh, from foreign uh, governments has always been anti-Ethiopian. The um, ancient kingdom of Aksum, for example, it was uh, Eritrea was, was a part of that. Eritrea, they speak Tigrinian. They are part of that culture. The, the Orthodox Church unites them. Um, they have about 50-50 Islamic foundation. In the Quran, you know, you look that the Prophet Muhammad sent the uh, first Islam uh, followers to the Christian king for refuge. So if we look from a cultural perspective, there should be no bad blood between Ethiopia and Eritrea from a cultural perspective. But what we find is that in 1890, when Eritrea was created by an Italian proclamation that the word Eritrea was created by the Italians, um, you know, Asmara was established by uh, Rasalula, which was an Ethiopian general who elevated it into a town from a, a, a village situation. Um, but there's a lot of animosity toward Rasalula and the Tigrinians because of the the vibe, the Italians, when they were in Eritrea though, when we look at just the facts, the education system that was put in during the reign of His Majesty, we see that His Majesty really elevated the education system. The Italians never had more than a fourth grade education for Eritrea while they were there. However, the poison that they, they put into the Eritrean people, um, you know, lingers to, to this day. Now people will argue His Majesty, they had a federation, His Majesty dissolved the federation. To the Pan-Africanists, if you look from a, a, a Pan-African perspective, Eritrea and Ethiopia are better together. Um, the, the coastline that Eritrea provides, the access to goods in the interior, and we have to ask, are either country better separated? And I think the answer is going to be no. And, and clarify this for me, I hear there's a big uh, one of the sources of the animosity is that they really, the Eritreans really helped with the military. Yes. And I guess they didn't get credit. And it seems like Ethiopia turned on them at a certain, if I'm getting the story yeah. correctly. Are you familiar with that one? Um, not 100%, but what I can say is that I, I don't also want to minimize the, the historic animosity because, again, we have to remember these are separate kingdoms that are unified into a nation. And even in Tigray, they were separate kingdoms which is what eventually split off. So the, the tribes on the, on the coast or the kingdoms on the coast to the interior uh, kingdoms of Tigray that was represented by Emperor Johannes, who was the emperor at the time of the creation of, of, of Eritrea. So I don't want to minimize that there were animosities. And a lot of these flare-ups that you see are because of these ancient and historic animosities. And His Majesty inheriting this reality, it goes beyond His Majesty. His Majesty gets a lot of the blame for it. So for example, if the Italians are funding a, a uprising, they, they see that there's, there might be some legitimate um, qualms that are happening between Eritrea and Ethiopia. But now a foreign power comes because all of the opposition groups during the time of um, the Federation and these things, a lot of them, let me say a lot because you never want to use all, were funded by the Italians or when you look, when you peel back, follow the money, you find out there were foreign interventions. So if I'm funding this group that has a legitimate grievance against the, the central government, and then let's say I put arms into the equation and I inspire them to uprise, and then the, the order is given to quell the uprising, and those generals that go out might have genuine animosity against Eritrea because human beings, the emperor now is going to get the blame, say him hate Eritrea. But when we look at the investments, er, um, Asmara was second only to Addis Ababa in terms of investment during the reign of His Majesty. When we look at the infrastructure that was being put in, the plans that were being put in, um, you know, it, Eritrean students being brought into the educational system and elevated through education. When we look at all of that, it's not consistent with someone, if I hate you, I'm not going to educate you. You know, and this is what people don't understand. So there were rebellions in Gojam, for example. But people are not going to say that, you know, that Ras Hailu used to run Gojam and him never liked his majesty and his father was Tekle Haile Manakata and them never liked the Shawans. And so these animosities, when we see these rebellions and are oftentimes they're funded by outside sources. As a head of state, I have to quell the rebellion. I have to send my military 
to quell these rebellions. And remember, these militaries might be a, a, a general whose ancestors also might have been an ancient king who never liked them people from mining. So, you know what I mean? When that kick up, I'm going to get the blame. You understand? So these are the things, and, and in terms of the bias and the criticism, I don't have any criticisms of the emperor, but I balance because I understand the reality that you can, he can't control the actions of all of his generals, of all of his um, people. So there's going to be legitimate things that happen, atrocities that took place, and I don't want to minimize that for my Eritrean brethren, my Oromo brothers, because I have brothers that me and them reach an overstanding. You know, one of my greatest moments was going to dinner with a group of Eritrean attorneys and the vitriol they had against the emperor, Miss Tanop. And by the end of it, you know what I mean? <laughs> they had to concede some things because, you know, we were giving them the facts. And, you know, so when you, and this is why I say the practice versus the theory. You know, if we stay in the theoretical realm, then there's, there's no messiness. If we go into the practice, I, I, I tell people, run a PTA meeting, become a board member in an association, see the type of opposition that you have now, multiply that times a country, multiply that times separate kingdoms and see, and then judges the emperor by what he was able to achieve, and then you will see. I don't, because I believe, I, well, let me clarify, I know Eilis Selassie is the almighty to I, but I don't have to give none of that to a person. I can just talk about the historical record. That glory is enough for I because the achievements are, are superhuman when you compare it to any other world leader. I put his majesty against any leader from beginning Ramses, Tutmo, you bring every one of them. I will put them against Kadamawi Haile Selassie because when you see what he was able to achieve, I remember he did not have the full support of the church either because he was modernizing. He didn't have the full support of Shawa because he's bringing in other people because your base wants you to stay tribal. He didn't have the support so you can't win because you are the young visionary that sees something a certain way but to implement it you have to just do and sometimes it's messy because it's not going to please everyone and I would say this to all brethren and sisters, you can't please everyone being a leader and this is the burden. An atheist, if you tell an atheist about the Almighty, what they, they, they'll say he's a tyrant. Oh, him let the little baby die round this up. How did he let the elder die, Miss Sparkle, who never troubled nobody, die of cancer? The Almighty is a tyrant. But if you don't know the full plan and vision of the Most High, then you're going to have that. But if you know and have that faith, then you will understand that there is a plan and that even in nature, if you look at a, a natural ecosystem, things die things happen but it's all for the greater balance and the greater good and I think that because of the Eurocentric view that we have we look at what the creator is supposed to do or what the king of all kings is supposed to be as being very linear and binary and very superheroish you never you know there are no consequences for the actions and that's just not how reality works and this is the framework that uh, we would like to place his imperial majesty and then when you put him into that context and you see the discipline that he exercised as a human being, when you see that the results that he was able to achieve, after the war with Italy, His Majesty had five million US dollars to run the entire country. Ten years after that, that had multiplied by orders of magnitude. So when you talk about fiscal responsibility in every sector of the Ethiopian uh, span of life, it's, it is unprecedented, it's not been fully documented and I came into this faith as a skeptic. So for I, that is how I, I balance my, my bias. I didn't grow up in the church. My father is a revolutionary Pan-Africanist in terms of, you know, he, he look at, even up to, to, to now, he looks at my channel and say, you know, what's all of this Bible? You know what I mean? My father and I love them thing there. You know what I mean? But I balance because His Majesty taught me to look at the Bible in a different light. And then I learned about the African Hebrew Israelite origin of the Bible through, you know, looking at it from a different light, from an Ethiopic perspective. So when we balance all of the factors and see how His Majesty was able to maintain this delicate balance, we don't talk about the organization of African unity yet. We're just talking about internally. 
in terms of what he was able to achieve with the military, uh, the airline, the transportation system, the energy sector, the banks, uh, telecommunicate, every facet. Uh, uh, this is one emperor who is training, investing in the youth of Ethiopia, that these same youths are the ones, remember, that were turned against him to run all of these revolutionary Marxist things. They had that luxury because they were educated, had the best education. They would go to France, they would go to Belgium, they would go to USSR, they would go to the US, and they didn't spend a dollar from their pocket. This was all paid for. That to I sounds like love. That don't sound like a tyrant. To I don't know too much tyrants who are funding the education of the youth. And if we had leaders today that were doing the same thing, providing scholarships for African students so that they could create this, this unity. And I also want to touch on, some people want to say His Majesty was a bandwagonist when it come on to African liberation and don't know that in the 20s, young Rastafari was helping to fund Marcus Garvey and the UNIA before there was a falling out with material resources that the UNA members were, were actually migrating to Ethiopia to settle before the Italian invasion. And people like myself would argue that that's part of the reason why the beast uh, in the Vatican made war against Ethiopia because they saw this influx um, of black people going in to rise up Africa um, in this revolutionary fashion. His Majesty was breaking down the barriers of tribalism, uh, putting an end to slavery. In fact, because even even though slavery was abolished in Ethiopia during the time of Manelik, it persisted because a lot of the races were getting a lot of uh, revenue. His Majesty had to stamp out these things. He shall set the captives free. So when the elder Rastafari brethren said these things, we can point to chapter and verse and historical records to show how he did that. When we talk about he shall wipe away oppression, set the captives free, um, rule uh, and, uh, and all transgression uh, uh, and rule inequality, all of these things are reality. You know what I mean? So I would just caution those who are the detractors to take a deeper dive into the reign of His Majesty and to really put away the feelings and, and look because many leaders have failed and we see subsequent, the subsequent leaders and their track record by the way, Malaise, all of these leaders are just implementing the development plan that was laid out by His Majesty, the, the Renaissance Dam. All of that was conceived, conceptualized. So there was no flaw in the development plan. That's called visionary. And you are often vilified if you are that visionary. And again, even among his own tribe or people, which um, His Majesty had a Romo blood, his Majesty had Shawin blood, His Majesty had Garagi blood, Aromo, you know, so he's all of these things. He's not just an Amhara emperor when we look at bloodline um, through his mother and his father. I write about these things in my book. So people have to, you know, it's, it's an emotional reaction and it's a propaganda reaction. It's sexy because we, we don't like monarchies anymore. But I would also caution people that in these democracies that you advocate for in theory, it's still families that end up controlling the thing. Monarchy is just a, a more honest um, way of looking at things because you can see where the power is stemming from. But when you fool yourself that democracy, who is running America? Right now in America, the, the population, if it was a democracy, cannabis would be free throughout the United States of America if we are going by the population. It remains illegal on a federal level. Why? Because the interests that wanted that way have stalled the will of the people. So this is not democracy uh, in the purest sense. So we have to remove all of these illusions. Corporations and families run creation. His Majesty being on the Solomonic throne was just being very upfront that this is how we're doing it, but we're going to outline power to the people so that there is you know, the people can filter, but this is why we say it's a constitutional uh, monarchy or a moral theocracy, as we would say in, in, in Rastafari.